This episode is brought to you by GoDaddy. To help start your business, GoDaddy is offering websites, marketing tools, and guidance all for free. Learn more at GoDaddy.com. This episode is brought to you by GoDaddy. To help start your business, GoDaddy is offering websites, marketing tools, and guidance all for free. Learn more at GoDaddy.com. Alex Goldman. PJ Vote. It sounds suspicious already. Uh, so before we start the show, we have a big announcement that we are very excited about. Yeah. We are adding a third host. Uh, somebody you already know, uh, Emmanuel Jochi. Emmanuel, hello. Hey, guys. And to be clear, adding a new host does not mean getting rid of one of the old ones. Uh, I didn't tell you about this right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, uh, we are not getting rid of any of our existing hosts, but we are adding Emmanuel as a host at Reply All. Uh, and basically the idea behind this move is like, we just want to give Emmanuel more space and support to do stories like the ones he's done, like big, ambitious reported pieces, like his three-parter on Alabama Democrats from the winter, or his story this summer about white people sending black people reparations on Venmo. You mean the story about like white people trying to like give black people what they deserve? Yes, that story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, but just to say that is not what this is. Um, yes, this promotion is not reparations in action. Um, it's just a reflection of the fact that we have a super talented reporter on our staff who is going to get a little more stage to tell stories on. Um, mm, thank you, PJ. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Basically, what you need to know as a listener is that the show is still going to be the show. Me and Alex are still going to be here telling each other stories, laughing at dumb jokes. You shouldn't necessarily expect Emmanuel in every single story. He probably isn't swooping into Yes, Yes, No, unless he really wants to. We just want him to have the space to do more ambitious work. Um, I really hope people are even half as excited as Alex and I are about this. Anytime we've made any change to the show, some people have freaked out. Literally after our second episode, there were people telling us that we changed too much and the old stuff was better. Is that uh, true? Yes. Yeah. They said that because we were doing stories about apps now and we'd sold out. Um, oh, yeah, that's right. This used to be a really creative show. Now they just do stories about stories apps. Stories about apps. Um, basically, the main thing I want to say is our show is going to keep changing. And while we hope that you like these changes, they are not totally for you. Making the show is a privilege. It is a pleasure. But for us, it is only worth it to the extent that we can keep it interesting, keep it different, and keep it challenging. We'd rather stop than repeat ourselves. So this is who we are today on the cusp of our show's sixth birthday. We've got a new host. Emmanuel, you want to do the From Gimlet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. From Gimlet, this is Reply All. I'm Emmanuel Jochi. And uh, I have a real bang of a story for you guys today. Let's hear it. So back in April, um, I got a tip from a reporter friend of mine down in Mississippi. She told me about this one really weird event that took place that she hadn't been able to stop thinking about. So say your full name for me and what you do. I'm Elisa Zool, and I'm a reporter for the Clarion Ledger. It's the newspaper in Jackson, Mississippi. And normally she's like, pretty big investigative reporter like she reports some political stuff that happens down there but also like their prisons mm -hmm. and her editor was just kind of like hey you know it's a weekend shift there's a couple of like sort of feel goody news stories buzzing around today why don't you just sort of like write one of these fluffy news pieces up they were looking for some levity during this time you know <laughs> been writing about only very serious sad coronavirus news for i don't know like two months now people could use a break just do a yeah. good news story yeah and like that day there was this story that broke on twitter um the mississippi emergency management agency nicknamed mima which as the name suggests handles like big disasters and stuff um basically what happened is mima and the mississippi department of health sent out like this big email to all of these regional emergency management directors around the state just offering information about coronavirus and how they're going to deal with it. Uh, and in particular, the email pointed to this one toll-free hotline that people could call or should call if they wanted to report incidents of people not adhering to social distancing or, like, businesses operating that, like, shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. Right. Anyways, this is what, and I'm just going to play it for you, this is what people heard when they actually called that number. 
welcome to America's Hottest Talk Line. <laughs> ladies are waiting to talk to you. Press 1 now. Ladies, to talk to interesting and exciting guys free, press 2 to connect free now. What is that? So, from what I've heard and just like read, right, uh, America's Hottest Talk Line is a phone sex line, uh, albeit a very heteronormative one. You call and I think you get so many seconds free. Um, that's pretty much it. So was the idea like people are stressed out around COVID, we're going to tell them that they're going to call a hotline, <laughs> but then instead we'll just give them like a very sexy telephone time as the state of Mississippi? Just take what we know about the state of Mississippi and say that's probably not the case. Um, but my friend Elisa, who was reporting the story, was like, whoa, this is weird. And so, of course, you know, she did the reporter thing and contacted the state of Mississippi to be like, what is this? Why did this happen? How did this happen? And Mima, so, you know, the Mississippi Department of Emergency Management, they got back to everybody and were just like, hey, so sorry. It was like a gone on mistake. And, you know, that for the most part was sort of the end of the story, right? Like, okay, funny little Sunday story. Did they point out, were they able to say like, oh, you know, the 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 phone sex hotline was like, one number to one, one like five 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 one three three three. Our hotline was five 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 one three three four. Like, were they able to say what it should have gone to? <laughs> you know, that's actually weird in that they didn't do that. They just said mm. that like the email was quote incorrect and directed callers to an inappropriate phone number, and that was kind of all they were offering. Um, but here's the thing: like Elisa, she googled America's Hottest Talk Line just to see if it could find like the company that was behind it, basically. Uh huh. But instead of finding a company website, I just found like dozens and dozens of news stories from all over the country of other agencies or businesses making the same exact mistake. So, you know, I I found an article about how after Hurricane Irma, FEMA put out a flyer for people that were looking for um, help after the hurricane. And when they called the number, it led to America's hottest talk line. Mm. When this happens, is it always the same phone number or is it different phone numbers? So it's always different phone numbers as far as I can tell. I haven't seen an instance where it's ever the same phone number. So America's Hottest Talk Line has also shown up in Maine. So like a couple of years ago, um, the state of Maine's like Department of Health and Human Services like released like a new EBT card for like food stamps and stuff. And you know how like on the back of a credit card or something like that, there'll be a toll free number you can call for yeah. like customer service or any questions. The state of Maine's EBT system sent out like a bunch of cards. Oh, my God. And on the back of the card, if you actually called that number... America's Hottest heard, Talk Line? Like, yeah, you, you got sent to America's Hottest Talk Line. Basically, you know, this hotline has popped up everywhere. It's sort of like this um, this parasite, right? <laughs> that has latched onto all of these different parts of the world that have no relation to each other at all. Like, I saw headlines that said numbers for the Yankees, the Baltimore Police, Marvel, like, all had at one point led to America's Hottest Talk Line. What the fuck is happening? One of the ones that I also saw that like really just jumped out of me is just like, whoa, that's that's really not good. Is that there was a sheriff's office somewhere down in Florida that released like a hotline saying, hey, victims of like domestic abuse or like sexual assault. Here's the number for like a service you can call run by this one organization. And it incidentally led to like America's Otters talk line, which is awful. You know, um, but the strangeness of this just kept growing for Elisa. Like there was this one video that Elisa had found from when another reporter had called the Mississippi number. And in that video, there was like this one little detail that had jumped out to her. If you watch the video, it it plays this message. Welcome to America's hottest talk line. And then it'll automatically hang up as soon as the message is over. Press two now. Which felt like a clue to her. Me, like you would think they would wait or like repeat the menu a few times because yeah. they want customers instead of just hanging up on you. Yeah. So I'm not even convinced that this is a real phone sex line. Alisa wondered if like this was just a recording and nothing more. So she decided that she was gonna call up the number Mississippi had sent out and find out for herself. I, I try to call that number. And it 
led to some sort of message that said, like, this is a non-working number in your area. Wow. That's like, that's so bizarre. Yeah, I, I've tried a couple of more times just to see, like, what is this bizarre glitch in the matrix doing mm-hmm. now? But America thought this talk line was gone. Like, when Elisa told me this, it just filled me with so many questions. Like, whoever's doing this, whoever's behind this, right? What I wanted to know was how are they making America's Hottest Talk Land show up on all of these different phone lines? Like, if, if this is just a recording and not a working phone sex line, it's it's hard for me to see, like, what the point is. You, you would also think that if there, if it is, like, it, it seems like it's some sort of scam. And if it is a scam, you'd think that targeting states over and over again, that eventually it, you would end up in court. Yeah. I don't know. But um, I told Elisa that I tried to figure it out. And what I found, just like over the course of reporting this, I should say, there were so many times, right, where I felt like I was the wrong reporter for this story. Like, I learned things that shook my Catholic vanilla ice cream loving self to the core in a pretty major way. Wow, okay. Um, <laughs> do you, you want to take the story from here? Yeah, that's what I'm going to do after the break. This episode of Reply All is brought to you by Aflac. Aflac is all about helping keep you prepared for life's surprises. Aflac! Like that one. The unexpected is just a part of life. And that includes things like medical emergencies, such as illness or injury, that you just can't predict. Most people don't know that their health insurance isn't designed to cover everything. That's why Aflac exists, to help cover the expenses health insurance doesn't cover. It acts as a safety net by paying you money directly unless otherwise assigned. So if you're worried about getting caught off guard with unexpected medical bills, Aflac can help bring you an extra layer of financial protection. See how Aflac can help with the expenses health insurance doesn't cover. Get to know them at Aflac.com. This episode of Reply All is brought to you by Squarespace. Creating a website used to be really hard. You had to know how to code and have the talent to design it yourself. But Squarespace changed all that with an all-in-one platform that makes building websites a breeze. It got us thinking about other tasks that seem like they should be easier by now. When I wash the duvet cover and I take the comforter out, then I have to put the comforter back in. And that is really where the trouble begins. That's Mary Johnson, a project manager at Gimlet. Because it's almost square, but it's not quite square. And so I make a guess as to what end goes in what corner. And that is inevitably incorrect. And it really is wrestling that comforter into the duvet. We're talking clumps of feathers. With Squarespace's award-winning templates, you can customize and preview your new site effortlessly. So you'll feel as accomplished as when you finish making your bed. When you're ready to launch, head to squarespace.com slash replyall for a free trial and use the offer code replyall to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Welcome back to the show. So the first thing I did after Elisa told me about America's Otters talk line was call the number the state of Mississippi sent out. And it wasn't dead anymore. Thank you for calling. Are you or someone in your household 50 years or older? Press 1 for yes, 2 for no. This wasn't America's Otters talk line. The number the Mississippi government had given out was now something completely different. Maybe I should just press. All right, I'll press. Thank you for calling the Medical Alert Center. This is Jessica on a recorded line. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, hi, Jessica. Um, I just wanted to say, so my name's Emmanuel. Great. So uh, with our promotion today, you actually have the opportunity to receive a free medical alert device. So wait, wait, hang congratulations. On, hang, on, hang on, sorry. Um, you know, Hello? it's that little button Hello? anywhere around your neck Hello? that you press in case Jessica, of emergency I just want to say or I'm a, I'm a reporter. A and now, a pub- when you're participating in our monitoring program, um, you actually can get <laughs> oh your medical God. alert absolutely free. I'd reached a service called Medical Alert which, from what I could tell, was basically just a knockoff of Life Alert, you know, the help I fall and I can't get up company, which made me even more confused than I was before. Because, like, how had a COVID hotline been taken over by a phone sex line only to be taken over again by a weird knockoff medical device company? 
So I tried another phone number from one of the other instances where America's Hottest Talkman had appeared, and I got another recorded message. Thank you for calling the Auto Saving Center. This is Tanya on a recorded line. You hear me okay? This recording was from a company called Protect My Car, which sounded very similar to the recorded message from Medical Alert. So the next number I tried, I decided to just wait on the line, see if they'd give me an option to talk to a real person. Please hold. Thank you for holding. With our promotion today, you have been selected to receive a free medical alert system. Hi, hi, hi. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Um, I'm calling because I was trying to reach another service, um, America's Hottest Talk Line. Uh, I thought it was by this number, but I guess it's not. All right, all right. Sir. Sometimes the phone number changes or the wrong button gets pressed. But in the meantime, you have the opportunity to receive a free medical alert system. Yeah, which have yeah. saved a I'd reached a real person, right? but yeah, no, this guy was on a major always be closing kick. No matter what I asked him, he would just try to sell me stuff. So I just called the numbers over and over and over again, trying to get information. Thank you for holding with our promotion today. You have been selected to receive a free medical alert system. So congratulations. Thank you. Oh, hi. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I just want to interrupt. Um, my name is Emmanuel Jochi and I'm a reporter. Um, I'm, I'm calling because I'm actually working on a story um, and I was trying to get um, in touch with like America's hottest talk line. Um, uh, are you guys owned by the same company? Well, I'm sure if you hang up and call back because you know sometimes phone numbers do change, the wrong button gets pressed. Yeah, but th- that's the thing. I know I didn't press the wrong number though. So that that's Mi- and Mr. Dootsy Jochi, sorry, but that's okay. I know it's a weird name. Dootsy Jochi Dootsy, but it's okay, Dootsy. <laughs> Eventually, I got another customer service rep who gave me information that seemed actually helpful. They told me that there was a directory I could call where I should be able to find America's Hottest Talk Line. What toll-free listing would you like? America's Hottest Talk Line. I think you said plan. If that's not correct, press 9. Please repeat your request. America's Hottest Talk Line. I think you said American concrete. If no. that's not correct, <laughs> press 9. Otherwise, I'll check. I tried calling these lines for several days and didn't get anywhere. I couldn't track down America's Otters talk line. But then I got my first real breakthrough when my colleague Daviano suggested I talk to a guy he'd interviewed once named Bruno Tabby, whose job is helping companies get 1 800 numbers. Hello? Hi, Bruno. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. So I called him and told him about America's Otters talk line. Have you ever heard of like. This thing, this phenomenon, America's yeah. Otters Talk Line? Yeah. Oh, you have? Bruno hadn't specifically heard of America's Otters Talk Line, but he thought it sounded a lot like the work of a company he knew. It probably goes by a lot of different names, but this is a company that owns a lot of very well-known phone numbers. Bruno said but the company mostly worked in toll-free numbers, that this company also seemed to be somehow connected to phone sex, that this company now seemed to be dabbling in other businesses as well, all without actually mentioning the name of this company. Finally, I just asked him, what's the name of the company? Uh, I guess it doesn't matter because it's public info, but they, they go by Primetel. Primetel. My initial assumption was that whoever was behind America's Hottest Talk Line was some fly-by-night operator. Like, some nerd somewhere having way too much fun with phone tech. But Bruno was like, No, 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 no. you're thinking about this all wrong. If the culprit is Primetel, this is no joke. Like, Primetel does not mess around. I would soon come to think of Primetel as a fortress. A fortress that I needed to get inside of to understand how America's Hottest Talk Line had taken over so many phone numbers. And I would spend the next four months talking to the people who cowered in its shadow. The people who studied it. The people who guarded it. And the people who'd built it. But to start off... Here's what Bruno told me about Primetel. Both Bruno and Primetel are in the toll-free number industry, otherwise known as a 1-800 business. 1-800 numbers, especially numbers like 1-800 lawyer, numbers that spell things, are incredibly valuable for any business to have. And so they pay companies like Bruno's business to go to incredible lengths to get certain numbers for them. Any numbers that are really valuable, they're not just like low-hanging fruit where you just maybe get them. Like we've bought businesses, just to, because we wanted the phone number. Wow. And yet somehow, in this industry where 1-800 numbers are so, so hard to get, Bruno told me that Primetel had a crazy number of them. They're a behemoth. 
it owns, uh, I believe the number is about 25% of the 800 numbers. Oh my God. How much is that? Like, how, what are we talking about? Millions. Millions. Millions of phone numbers. Yeah. That fact, that PrimeTel controls millions of toll-free numbers, that's all I could learn from Bruno. So I started to call other people in the toll-free industry, and they told me PrimeTel is a really secretive company. The nickname they have is the black hole because it's like where things went to disappear. Like, you don't know what's in the black hole. It's like this mystery. And I think that's just the way they operate. Encounters with this so-called black hole were rare and brief. I met two of the programmers one time at a conference, and they're as tight-lipped as the whole company is. Wow. You don't get their names. You don't get any information. You're not going to find somebody inside that wants to tell you about it all. This same guy would go on to compare Primetel, without irony, to Kaiser Sose. And the little information that people did know, they were super hesitant to tell me. Like, I called this one guy, Greg Fernandez, who went on and on about how much he respected the person who ran Primetel. I would just love, like, just just to take her out for a cup of coffee, just to, to see how she ticks, you know? To take who uh, just, out? To, oh, the, the person behind... Uh, behind the, the conglomerate. Oh, who is that? Who is she, it sounds like? Yeah, it is a she. Um, and I don't want to, if you don't know, I, I don't know, Emmanuel, I, I'm, I don't know if I want to out her. I mean... I'm saying, I, I've been saying very <laughs> kind things about them, and it's, everything I've said about them is true. Uh, they're, they're very powerful people. Wow. Huh. They're very, 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 very powerful. Like, just, I don't know. I guess I want to, I don't want to make you, I don't want to, like, am I putting your business at risk by asking you to go on the record about this? Is, like, that kind of power thing? I, I, I don't, yeah, I don't want to, you know, um, yeah, I don't want to rock the boat. How's that? Who was this mystery genius woman? And if she was behind America's Hotel's talk line, taking over all of these toll-free numbers, How exactly was she and her company doing it? I kept having visions of some nondescript office building somewhere, like far from prying eyes, filled with the sort of employees you meet at DC happy hours, whose answer to what do you do is to vaguely say that they work in consulting, even though you know and they know that there was a lot more to their job and they have a lot of power over your life. I searched online for any scrap of information about Primetel. They have no website, no Facebook page. There was one red herring, a company based in Cyprus called Primetel. It was not them. But then, after digging through some legal documents, I realized that my Primetel seemed to have a whole network of different aliases and partner companies, all with very generic names like National A1, Mayfair, or Zipline. And I began searching for people who worked for those companies. That's how I found a woman I'm going to call Evelyn. Hello. Hello. Hi. (laughs) Where am I talking to you? I'm in beautiful Philadelphia, East Falls neighborhood. And uh, this is my office. Nice. um, Where the magic does not happen ever. Like Bruno, Evelyn told me she'd never heard of America's Hottest Talk Line specifically. But it sounded like the kind of service Primetel might run. And Evelyn knows this because she's worked for National A1 and Primetel in a range of capacities for more than 25 years. In fact, she says she helped create it. Although when she joined, she had no idea what she was getting into. The year was 1992. Evelyn was living in Philadelphia, and she just graduated college. I'm working as a librarian making bank, obviously. So I'm looking for shit to do, and I see this ad in the paper, in the city paper, and it says, I remember back page, it was really kind of, anyway, you don't remember. Um, but uh, <laughs> so it said, um, we're needing uh, romantic fantasies. Romantic fantasies? Romantic fantasies. This is just this ad, asking for romantic fantasies. The people who'd posted the ad needed at least 10 fantasies, and were offering to pay 10 bucks for each one, which to Evelyn... But like easy money, especially since her grand plan was to plagiarize from a book of 1970s romance fantasies. But by the time Evelyn got around to calling the number in the ad with her stolen fantasies, they were no longer looking for people to write them. They were looking for people to read them, which to Evelyn felt like even easier money. So Evelyn scheduled a time to go in and read at this company's offices. Only when she went in for her audition, she realized it wasn't your typical workplace. So describe to me, like, the day you walked in, like, what it looked like and stuff. 
Oh my gosh. So you pretty much walk in and they have to buzz you in because it's like killer thick glass. This place was like a little door. The window that you see from the street is just cluttered with watches and and jewelry and just junk. Oh, so you went into like a pawn shop. Yes. Were you surprised when you walked up and you're like, oh, this is just like a oh, watch shop? I was fascinated. And, and it was it was just, oh, um, and then here's the funniest part is that there's a, uh, this old man, like super old man on a, a elevated stool, like slumped over, like drooling into his chest, essentially just this a sweet, adorable, like, like, it looked like a sunken mushroom of a man just sort of collapsed on himself. <laughs> and I walked in and I thought maybe he was the guy I was supposed to talk to because I'm an idiot and he's the first one. So I just sort of walked up staring at him. And then someone's like, yo, yo. And they're talking to me even behind me. And I'm where? Who, who am I talking to? So when I turn around and the next thing I know, I'm walking down this this dingy stair and I'm in this weird office that's like very low ceilings. And, and there's these pinups and teddy bears everywhere. And she What? Just, she just like the new basement <laughs> filled with pinups and teddy bears it was here in the diamond district of philadelphia in the strangely decorated basement of a pawn shop called the national watch exchange that is pawn spelled p-a-w-n but an empire would eventually be born the owner of national watch exchange was a man named richard cohen years later he would become the co-owner of primetel but back when she met him evan said richard he was just a guy looking for the next big way to make money she said Richard looked like George Farragut, which, according to my favorite editor and resident expert on white guys from the 70s, Tim Howard, means Richard Cohen looks like the dude who sang bad to the bone. He's got like wings, like 70s kind of hair. You know, oh, but, okay. But his eyes are, I always thought, that's one thing I always think of him, they're his eyes. They're very, a lot of people will immediately be like, oh, that guy's creepy. What about his eyes seem creepy? Have you ever been into a jewel- in a jewelry store, like a pawn shop, and the guy behind the counter and is like, "Hey, what do you got?" Yes. <laughs> That's kind of Richard. Richard says Evelyn was constantly on the hunt for things of value. He was a collector, and those teddy bears that lie in the basement, those were the crown jewels of his collection. They're his babies. They're his children. He loves his bears. Like, and these are just like teddy bears. They're stife. What is a stife bear? It's the Rolex of teddy bears, my friend. You look at how expensive is. People pay, like, it's ridiculous. They've been making bears in Germany for, like, a, over 100 years. There's oh, my God. Bear. Look so that up. Did he have names for them? Yes. And, and, and lives and everything. I didn't realize this at the time. I've learned this since. But, yes, it's real. It's hardcore. Like, he loves his bears. He loves, loves his bears. In addition to loving his bears... Evan described Richard as a bit of a recluse. You'll never get him to talk to you, she told me. And she was right. Richard didn't respond to my letters, calls, or emails. He didn't talk to me for this story. No one officially representing Primetel did either. Anyways, according to Evelyn, back in the early 90s, Richard was firmly in his pawn shop business, running it with his brother, when he realized that there was another way he could make money off of customers who frequented the store. One of the problems with um, being a person who didn't have a whole lot of uh, money back in the day is that you couldn't get a phone because phone companies needed you to have an address and needed you to have a bank account and all sorts of other stuff. Evelyn says Richard saw these folks needed phone lines and came up with an idea. He bought a voicemail system and had it installed in his basement. And how it worked is that Richard could rent phone numbers out to his clients, only they couldn't make calls on those lines. Instead, people would call them at their number and leave a message. So if you, a lot of people who were kind of shady or a lot of people, like this is what they did is that they had, a, you know, a block of different numbers and, oh, that's the number where I'm a insurance adjuster and that's the number where I deal out of. And so they, they had a system like that and we, and it was very cheap. It was like 10 bucks a month for a mailbox. Wow. So people would just come in with their dollars and whatever. We should have found a backdoor into the phone industry. More and more people were paying Richard so that they could receive voicemail messages. And it was around this moment, Evan figures, Richard might have had another one of his there's a way to make more money moments. This is just me, but I think he he's nosy as all get out. So I would imagine he's probably <laughs> listening to the messages <laughs> and realized that a lot of people were meeting. And that probably gave him the idea. He's like, ah, this is kind of computer dating. So he bastardized a voicemail system and tinkered with it and got it to work as a personals system. That's kind of smart. 
It is. It really is. Once Richard created this personal service, he asked Evelyn to be the new voice of his fledgling phone system. It would be her job to record all the prompts and menus for Richard's different phone services, which were constantly changing. I'm curious, like, right off the bat, like, what did you used to say on these messages? Oh, well, it would be something like... Let's get my voice. So it's pretty much like... Hold on. Oh, you're okay. Welcome to Talk To Me's Cute Talkers program. You'll be set into our chat line while waiting for a caller to make a direct <laughs> connection with you. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Come on, now don't encourage me. Richard took his personal system and created a service called Philadelphia's number one date line. People would pay to leave each other voicemail messages. I talked to a woman who helped moderate this dateline. She told me that it was popular with people looking for partners with like-minded fetishes and fantasies. I wondered if maybe this was a really early incarnation of what would become America's hottest talk line, except without the phone sex. Evelyn told me Richard expanded the dateline beyond Philadelphia, went regional, and then went national via 900 numbers, which is where a lot of adult content was back in the 90s. Using 900 numbers, though, was becoming a bigger and bigger problem. Parents were freaking out because they didn't want little Johnny calling up weird date lines, fetish lines, or phone sex services. Let's send one single clear message to the industry, to the parents of America and the people of America. So lawmakers started introducing bills. We do not want, we will not allow, we will not tolerate dial up horn in this country. Bills designed to crack down on 900 numbers. It felt like the end for 900 numbers was nigh. And it was clear Richard needed to find another way to make money. So he got a business partner who would help him do just that. That partner was a woman named Sandra Kessler. She was a so-called genius I'd heard rumors about from industry insiders. Oh, she's such an interesting character. Oh my God. She's a, she's a demon. She could get whatever she wants. From what Evelyn told me, Sandra had big hair like Fran Drescher and talked in a sort of frenetic kind of way that might give a person an anxiety attack. And if Richard's great love was teddy bears, Evelyn said Sandra's was somehow even more unexpected. She's a robot collector. That's how she got started. A robot collector? A robot collector. She would go to um, flea markets and things like that and she would just know what to pick that would be worthwhile, and it, she made, like, gobs of money just knowing what to grab. Richard trusted Sandra's business savvy unconditionally. And Sandra, confronted with Richard's 900 number woes, had an idea. Sandra wanted to start a new company, and it was actually a type of company that had only just been invented, called a Responsible Organization, or RESPORG, which, of course, is the most generic, boring name. Anyways, these RESPORGs, they were a special kind of phone company that managed and distributed toll-free numbers. You see, a few years earlier, the FCC had tasked a small group of people with overhauling the entire toll-free system. It took years to get every detail right. I was fortunate enough to be in that whole design, and one of the things we designed is what became Restports. Wow, so you're one of the like designers of this current system, basically. Yes. Wow, yeah. okay. There were about 10 of us around the country that designed the whole system. Whoa. Okay, so I have so many questions for you <laughs> about the system. <laughs> this is Aaliyah Christofferson, toll-free industry legend. So I'm curious, just in the system that you designed, like, if I came to you in 1993 or 1994 and was like, okay, I would like to get hooked up with a toll-free number, what would the uh, pathway have been? It's the same today. Okay. You contact your restborg and say, I want 800 lawyer. Yeah, you know, a number like that. The rest board determines whether it's available. If it's spare, which is what they call available, then the rest board reserves the number right then. Yeah. And then nobody else can have the number. So let's say, I don't know, a taqueria wants 1-800-BURRITO. They have to go to one of these rest boards, maybe a big phone company like Verizon, maybe a smaller outfit. And if a number's available, the rest board will get it for them from a big pool of available numbers. All the Taqueria has to do is keep paying their monthly phone bill to the Restborg. To be in the phone business in the mid-90s was to be in a bona fide 1-800 number feeding frenzy. Everybody wanted a number that spelled something, and Restborgs were only too happy to oblige. Each 800 number was incredibly cheap for them to grab, but businesses were so desperate, they paid good money just to get them. 
So Westborgs were popping up left and right. And even though Aaliyah and her colleagues had tried to hammer out every last detail of how Westborgs would work, there was one major flaw in their design. We thought the only people who were going to be Westborgs would be the big long distance and local companies. So at most, we'd maybe have 30 Westborgs. Well, you know, there's over 300 Westborgs. Wow. Over 300. Yeah. And that was never the way we visualized it. I don't know. On the one hand, it feels like you guys were so meticulous in designing the system. But the thing you didn't account for seems so shocking to me that, like, people would find a way to make money off of this. We didn't really design to that. We talked about it kind of on the fringes. And somebody says, I don't know what kind of money-grubbing little company would become an independent rest board. Turns out, a money-grubbing company headed by a robot collector and a teddy bear lover. Back in the Diamond District of Philadelphia, Sandra and Richard decided, OK, we want in on this. We're going to make our own rest board, grab some of these 800 numbers, and use them all for our chat lines. And then we'll have people pay by credit card to use them. We'll make a killing. Richard realized that... All those numbers are worth something. If it spells anything dirty, then if you look at the traffic at the time, there were men that just sat around spelling out dirty words on their phone, wondering if it was going to be somebody saying something dirty. Really? Yeah. That Resborg, the phone company they created, was Primetel. Primetel was run by Sandra. And as she got more and more numbers for Richard's datelines, Richard realized he could be making even more money. And a few years later, in 2000, he expanded his business into phone sex, opened a new call center and moved his entire business to a whole new building. Which was a weird move at the time because the few surviving phone sex companies were actually downsizing, asking phone sex workers to work remotely. But Richard's gamble paid off. All over the country, people were typing in dirty words into their phone, landing on one of Richard's phone sex lines and forking over their credit card information for the chance to talk to, quote, sexy young girls, which is funny because, of course, the new phone sex operators sitting on the other end of the line were in the most unsexy place imaginable. What did the space, what did the office look like? I'm just so intrigued to know, like, what was the setup? It was very much like a call center walking in where there's, like, a scrolling LED sign of, like, the top bonuses of the month. There's seasonal decorations up. I started in July, so... There were like palm trees and lays and like beach balls around. (laughs) You know, it's like, you know, furnishing hell to make it look like it's not as hot of a place. That's a woman I'm going to call Felma. She worked for Richard in his phone sex call center for a year and a half. And she said she found the job challenging from the very beginning. It is so difficult to keep a horny man who is masturbating on the phone for $3 a minute so that you can get your minute quota in. Oh, was that kind of the main aim of it? Was just like, keep these guys on the phone? Keep them on the phone. The calls would max out at certain lengths, depending on what they paid for and whether they were a preferred customer or not. But your calls could max out at 15 minutes, 35 minutes, or 45 minutes. 45 minutes? Yeah. Wow. Felmer's trick to slow these guys down and keep them on the phone was to tell a lot of jokes. Men seemed to find it hard to stay turned on and laugh at something at the same time. But maybe the worst part about the job was something I'd never even considered. When customers reached the phone sex line, they could choose the race of a woman they wanted to talk to. And so phone sex operators pretended to be women of different races. They actually got a list of stereotypical characters they could play for each one. But if the customer didn't request an ethnicity, the default was a white woman. My initial name that they gave me was, first it was Angel, and then they changed it to Savannah. And (laughs) Savannah was 5'3", 120 pounds, blonde, like just the stereotype that even other white women are like, oh, seriously? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? <laughs> just the total bubblehead from National Lampoon cheerleader type movies, <laughs> that type of thing. Yeah. This is Danielle, another one of Richard's phone sex operators. Danielle's a self-described BBW, or big black woman. In fact, most of the people working in the call center were black women. And having to play Savannah really bothered Danielle. Especially at that point in my life, I was so, I I had to do like a lot of, you know, uh, therapy and things like that because um, 
being an African-American woman, you're already bombarded with you're not pretty enough. You're not good enough. You're lesser than everybody else. Like, you know, there's that, that gradient scale. It starts out with white women and then it's Asian and Hispanic. And then black is at the end. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, I get what you're saying. So, I, you know, it was really bad for my self-esteem. And I was like, I just I can't. So Danielle broke the rules just a little, made her default character a Greek white woman. Her managers tolerated it, but only because Danielle was arguably the best phone sex operator they had. She says she was so good that people from around the company used to eavesdrop on her calls. They thought she had to be doing something shady to be that good at her job. In fact, it was pretty clear to Danielle and Thelma that Richard and the rest of management didn't really trust the phone operators. As a rule, they were purposely kept away from the rest of the company. Thelma says the manager who ran the call center was extremely intense about it. We were encouraged not to talk to anyone in the elevators, not to like interact or bother people. I mean, we were treated like, I wouldn't even say second class citizens. It was like we were like rats in the building that other people had to tolerate. Oh my God. Um, We weren't supposed to know about anything. We weren't supposed to know about open enrollment when the health insurance changed. Oh, Um, what? Very, very isolating to work there like they did not want you to have knowledge about anything else that went on in that building which is why when i asked Felmer and danielle were the calls you were taking for america's hottest talk line they were like weirdly we don't know all we did was pick up the phone the company had a lot of different phone sex hotlines but we didn't really have any idea which service for callers were coming to us through which meant it's totally possible that Thelma and Danielle could have answered calls for America's Otters talk line and never even known. But Danielle told me something else that felt like a clue. Every now and then, she would get a call from someone who didn't know they were in for some phone sex. Some people, oh, God bless them. You, every once in a while, you get like an elderly person. <laughs> oh, like, really? Oh, how did you how did you get this number grandma (laughs) (laughs) welcome for both of us now (laughs) were people like honestly very confused uh yeah yeah and often embarrassed you know especially if you had to tell them what number they called (laughs) you know like it's like no this is a phone sex line ma'am sir (laughs) the what (laughs) yeah i can't help you with your washer or dryer i don't i don't know maybe i don't know what model do you have let's talk (laughs) according to Elia christopherson the woman who'd helped create the toll free system confused people ending up on the phone sex line was the direct result of a move richard and sandra made to take their business beyond just grabbing sexy numbers and move into the next stage of their toll-free empire. They were the first place where I heard about misdials, which is now a big industry. Misdials? Misdials. She told me that when, like, a shoe company announced their new toll-free number, 1-800-SLIPPER, Primetel would be watching. Primetel knows, you know, thousands and thousands of people are going to call that number. So they get the number maybe right below it. You know, they get one that's really easily misdialed. Yeah. And they probably get the numbers, all of them that are around a number, you know, anything that that can cause somebody to easily misdial. In the past, Primetel has denied that they have a misdial strategy. But multiple experts in the industry told me otherwise. What these experts told me is that back then, most Westborgs assumed that out of the millions of toll-free numbers out there, Only a small percentage, the ones that spelled things, were truly valuable. The others, well, they were a dime a dozen. It's almost as if Sandra and Richard realized, oh, no, those ordinary-looking, unremarkable numbers are actually super valuable because of misdials. Now, of course, maybe only one out of a thousand people who call your number by accident will stay on the line. But if you have, say, millions of phone numbers, you're looking at a small fortune. What I know for sure is that Sandra dedicated a whole floor of Richard's building to Primetel and filled it with computers. A woman who used to work as an assistant to Richard, who I'm going to call Shelley, she hated going down there. What did it look like, their floor? Oh my God, it was lots of computer equipment. I don't know the tech at the time, but I, I, I it was probably one of the reasons why it was so fucking cold down there, because some big computer servers were probably down there. It was like the offices were like purposely Voldemort creepy. It was bizarre. It gave this overall ambience of of trolls 
digging in mine. As Voldemort creepy as Prime Tail's setup was, their technology gave him a real advantage over the competition. While other Westborgs had employees dutifully requesting numbers one at a time, Prime Tail had computer programs grabbing numbers in bulk. And these phone numbers they were grabbing, they weren't only brand new phone numbers that had never existed before. They were also phone lines people thought were still theirs, that they'd lost because they'd forgotten to pay their phone bill at some point. Eventually, though, these people realized they'd lost their phone lines and were very confused. And Evelyn and Shelley, both employees of National A1, had the weird experience of seeing this phenomenon happening in the world in front of them all the time and knowing exactly why so many people were pissed off. I had a pulmonary director at 10 call me to complain, why is my private office number a fucking porn number? American Idol, all the numbers for their finalists were like 800, da, 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 da. So when people were trying to vote 888 for their idol, they were coming to me. I got calls from people who had numbers in other countries and other places who could barely speak English. I was married at the time to a podiatrist in Augusta, Georgia, and their main office number got swiped. So people were calling the doctor's office and it would go, thanks for calling Philadelphia's number one date line. Wait, so your own husband... My His phone husband, number gets taken, phone. and when people are calling him, they're hearing you? But they didn't know it was me, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> All of this, of course, sounds exactly like what was happening with America's Hottest Talk line. Tons of people very confused as to how a phone sex line had taken their number. And I think it sounds exactly like what was happening with America's Hottest Talk line. Because it is what's been happening with America's Hottest Talk line. I am now confident that when Mississippi put out their COVID line one of two things could have happened. Both totally legal. Some poor soul I'm going to make up in the Health and Human Services office, I'm going to call them Zach, might have misprinted the number by like one digit when they wrote that email. And PrimeTel, because they have so many millions of toll-free numbers, they just happened to control the number that our man Zach inadvertently emailed to tons of important people. Or Zach, bless him, actually didn't make a typo. He published the correct phone number, but he did so without realizing that a month earlier, Earl, in accounting, hadn't paid the bill for it. And in the meantime, Primetel, ever seeking new numbers to make its strategy work, snapped it up without anybody realizing it. I know Primetel did at least one of those things, because with the help of my new Westborg friends, I was able to search the database of toll-free numbers, find out which Westborg controls the number Mississippi sent out, and lo and behold, that Westborg is one of Primetel's partner companies and is registered under Richard Cohen and Sandra Kessler. Primetel was the reason that number and so many others led to America's hottest talk line. But there was this thing that didn't make sense. It's 2020. Phone sex is not what the libidinous young people of America are turning to. Thelma told me that National A1, which is company, was hit really hard by free internet porn. And in 2015, she and tons of other people got laid off. It was really hard. Do you know how Richard felt about the layoffs? Or like just like upper management in general? They really did not like to take people's jobs. Oh, um, why? I don't know. But I mean, I don't think they wanted to get rid of people until it came down to like, we're just not making the money that we used to make. So we can't sustain more people hmm. um, than, is, than is beneficial. But, you know, that was the thing is we weren't competing against competitors who did, had similar products. We were competing against free. From what I can tell, this glut of free online porn sites meant Primetel, yet again, had to find a new way to make money with their millions of phone numbers, which explained the different services I found when I tried to reach America's Hottest Talk Line. Thank you for calling the Medical Alert Center. This Thank you for calling the Auto Saving Center. This is Tony. I think Primetel's alleged misdial strategy is still going on. The crucial difference is that now they're renting out phone numbers to businesses like Medical Alert and Protect My Car. So why is it that every once in a while, a dinosaur of a phone sex line like America's Otters Tool Climb pops up? It bothered me that after months of reporting, I didn't know. I'd still never actually even found it or talked to anyone who'd tell me definitively that they'd heard of it. America's Otters Tool Climb seemed to appear and just as quickly vanish, like some kind of ghost. The closest I'd come to finding it was the one recording Elisa, the reporter who told me about the service, had shown me. A recording that contained a clue that had really puzzled both of us. Guy, 
five hot ladies are waiting to talk to you. Press one now. Ladies, press two now. The fact that America's Hottest Talk line didn't seem to actually go to a phone sex line, that the service hung up on you after playing a short recording, I eventually came up with a theory about that. According to an industry insider, if you're a restborg like Primetel, you can't just grab numbers and hoard them. A service needs to be on each and every toll-free number you have, or else eventually you could lose it. So I thought it would make sense that if Primetel wanted to cover their bases and make it look like they were really using numbers they didn't have services on yet, they'd have to put something, some sort of placeholder on the line. And in this case, they'd used a recording. But my producer Anna, thank God for Anna, she wouldn't rest until we knew for sure that America's Hottest Talk Clan was a fake. So she came up with a brilliant idea. To find an antiquated, possibly fake business, we needed to use antiquated methods. Her plan was to call as many toll-free numbers as we could that included the numbers 739, otherwise known as S-E-X. Welcome to America's Hottest Talk Line. Oh my Guys, God. hot ladies are waiting to talk to you. Press 1 now. Ladies, to talk to interesting and exciting guys free, press 2 to connect free now. After all this time, I finally found America's Hottest Talk Line. And the first thing I noticed was that it wasn't just a recording. I pressed 1 to talk to hot ladies, and it immediately prompted me to record a message describing myself. Please record your message. Hit any key when you're done. Hi there. Um, My name is Emmanuel Jochi. I said I was a reporter, that I was recording, and that I was hoping to interview someone for a story about America's Hottest Talk Line. Pretty quickly, I heard short descriptive recordings of women I could choose to talk to. A woman from Michigan who described herself as a Yupa girl, which apparently means she's a lifelong resident of the Upper Peninsula. Another woman who was looking for a sexy white dude who looked like Brett Michaels. And it dawned on me, maybe these women weren't phone sex operators. These were women looking for white guys with questionable music taste. And then, someone messaged me. This message was sent with priority delivery. I love your accent. Where are you from? To connect live with this caller, press 1. Reply with a message or please record your invitation for this caller to join you in a private conversation. Record after the tone. Hit any key when you're done. Hi, yeah, so uh, I'm actually from England. Uh, uh, but a lot of people I feel like have trouble knowing where my accent's from because I've lived in a lot of places. Uh, I was born in England, moved to Belgium as a kid, uh, spent time in Ohio. Um, yeah, anyways, looking forward to chatting with you. Please hold while that caller listens to your connection request. They liked what they heard, and they're ready to connect with you. You're connected. Say hi. Hi there. How are you? Fine. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Um, Would it be okay if I recorded our conversation uh, for broadcast on my show? Yeah, I don't care. Okay. Cool, cool. Awesome. I love your accent. Oh, thank you so much. Where are you from? Tennessee. Oh, Tennessee. Where in Tennessee are you from? Chattanooga. Chattanooga. Oh, Chattanooga, okay. Chattanooga, right down on the Georgia line. Wow, I actually, um, I actually drove through Chattanooga uh, earlier on in the summer. It's a really beautiful town. Yeah, it is. I'm in Indiana now. People say, "Why did you move to Indiana?" I said, I "Got stupid." You got stupid. <laughs> I got, got crazy. <laughs> <laughs> this is Jean. She's seventy-seven. She told me she heard about America's Hottest Talk Line from one of her friends, and she very clearly is not a phone sex operator. Can you just tell me about this service? Like, what is this uh, line about? Like, is it is it like a, a date line? Well, kind of. You can you talk to some nice people. You talk to some filthy mouth guys. They're all the time wanting to know if it's true what they say about redheads. <laughs> this guy sent me a message and one of the carpet matched the drapes. 
I went back to him and said, no, the carpet's green. <laughs> Did he respond? No, he didn't, say, he didn't say a word. There's married men on here. There's some guys looking for a female to be with him and his wife. I thought you were crazy, bud. You're not here for that? No. And what what are you here for? What are you looking for? Just see if I can find a friend to talk to. Mm-hmm. Somebody that doesn't have a filthy mouth. Jean is not who I expected to find on America's Hottest Talk Line. She lives in a nursing home, suffered a stroke last year and lost her sight as a result. And around that time, she started calling up the hotline and became a regular. I don't know. Sometimes I'll get on it every day, just listen. Don't talk to anybody, just listen. Just see who's on there. Do you have, like, a lot of visitors who come see you? No, we're not allowed to have visitors right now. Oh, because of COVID. Yes. They stick you in a room and you can't go anywhere. Oh, so you guys can't even socialize amongst each other in the nursing home right now. Well, they have finally started letting us go down for either breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Yeah. But uh, we have to sit so far apart from people that I can't see who they are. And you don't really get to meet them when you're at one end of the table and they're six feet away at the other end. Ah. And of course, with my eyesight, it's hard. I tell people they're just fuzzy blobs. I'm sorry. Don't be. I've, I've got what I've got. Talking to Jean reminded me of my granny. She's in her 80s, lives alone in England. She actually has one of those medical alert devices. Refuses to wear it, though, which is a major problem because she falls from time to time. I spoke to her the other day, and at first I didn't get through because she was on another call. She always seems to be on another call talking to some friend or family member. I think it's what's made these last few months of being unable to leave her house bearable, talking to people. And chatting with Jean, I realized she didn't have a lot of that at the moment. I've been sort of half right about America's Hottest Talk line. It wasn't a phone sex line or even a dead-end recording. Maybe it was a placeholder, a near-zero overhead unstaffed callback to Richard's first innovation that Primetel only brought out when they needed to call dibs on a line. But it was performing a service. It kept people like Jean company. It was a tonic for the lonely. Well, I hope that I have, like, uh, like provided like some form of, of entertainment to break up some of the monotony today. You did. And like I say, I still love your voice. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, it was such a pleasure talking to you, Jean. You too. Okay, you have a good day. we Will do. Same with you. Bye-bye now. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Reply All is hosted by PJ Vogt, Alex Goldman, and starting today, me, Emmanuel Jochi. 
Our show was produced this week by Shufi Pinamaneni, Fia Benin, Damiana Marchetti, Anna Foley, Jessica Young, and Lisa Wang. Our intern is Mohini Madgalka. Our executive producer is Tim Howard. We were mixed by Rick Kwan. Theme song and original music by Breakmaster Cylinder. Fact-checking by Michelle Harris. Additional music production by Mario Romano. And original music by Luke Williams. Special thanks today to Teresa Apel, Joel Bernstein, Paul Faust, James Brown, Mike Connors, Mo Tarsic, and Lena Masitsis. Matt Lieber is snuggling up to watch an episode of Girlfriends after a very long week. Also, we are currently looking for spring and summer 2021 interns. The application is open now, so go to our website, replyallshow.com to apply. Don't wait. Applications are due in just a couple days on October 5th. You can listen to our show on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening, folks. We'll see you in two weeks. So what happens on this podcast, Alex? The podcast is going to answer the following question. What do we need to do to address the climate crisis? And how do we make those things happen? We're going to be answering that question on this podcast every week from now until... Until? The job is done, Until Ayanna. the job is done. I'm trapped and I want a better <laughs> prenup. <laughs> from Gimlet, How to Save a Planet is out now. With me, Alex Bloomberg. And me, Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Podcasts.